Well, hello and welcome to the Federal Low Code Trailblazers podcast, episode number two. This podcast is part of the ATARC Federal IT Newscast. My name is Bill Bunce, and I'm an account executive with Pegasystems and the industry chair for the ATARC Low Code Working Group, which is a subset of the ATARC DevOps technology pillar. Just so that we're all on the same page, according to Wikipedia, a low code development platform provides an environment used to create application software through the use of graphical user interface uh, instead of traditional hand coded computer programming. So why this podcast? Our goal of this podcast is to meet with government leaders uh, and government industry who are leveraging low code on real projects to understand why they selected low code uh, as a software development method, the challenges they had uh, to overcome and the benefits that they're realizing. According to Gartner, 50% of all software will be developed on a low code platform by 2023. That's not all that long from now. If that's the case, then we shouldn't have any problem finding government leaders uh, that are leveraging low code uh, on projects with lots of lessons learned for us to talk about. This month's topic is sample low code use cases in the government. And my guests are um, Cherian um, Savanyanam. Uh, he is the chief enterprise architect at the National Science Foundation. And Cherry and um, I apologize if I, I didn't get your last name right. We mm -hmm. also have uh, Kirk Averson, uh, who is the uh, intelligent automation practice leader at KPMG. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. If I could, uh, thanks. If I could ask each of you to uh, please just introduce yourself uh, and share with us your relationship with low code application development and low code platforms. Um, uh, chairs in if you could uh, go first. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Artek and uh, Bill and uh, Kirk for inviting me to this panel. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here with you all speaking today. Um, let me start with a brief introduction. Uh, I'm the chief agency's chief architect and I also play uh, the informal role of being a chief technology officer and therefore I get to lead uh, a lot of technology innovation efforts of the agency. Um, and uh, as you may have recently noticed uh, in media that NSF as an agency is going through a major transformation uh, to reestablish the US leadership in the field of science research. Um, so to make this happen, we are leveraging a concept called speed and scale to power this transformation actually. Um, Technology is a big catalyst in any uh, transfer, organizational transformations. Um, to increase uh, the business agility um, within the organization, we have added several new technologies to our architecture, um, like you know, robotic process automation, um, you know, augmented intelligence, and low-code platforms. And that is probably the topic for today. So um, we, are, we are taking a huge advantage of these technologies. Uh, today, I'm here to share our experience and take your feedback and looking forward to the discussion. And uh, I guess I'll go next. Uh, so thanks, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to, to join the discussion today. To, thanks to ATAR, Bill, and, and Charian as well. It's, it's great to be on the panel with NSF. What, what a great organization, you know, the amount of, of, of grants that are out there in the scientific community for, 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 uh, for those uh, types of um, activities. Uh, so, so my name is Kirk Everson. Uh, as, as Bill mentioned, I lead our um, intelligent automation practice that includes elements of, uh, of low code that, that we provide to our customers. Um, and, and I would say that the term low code is definitely a general term that we use for a number of different technologies. As Terry mentioned, it's, it's the platform itself, platform as a service, software as a service, RPA and others. Uh, there are a lot of vendors in this space. And so what we try to do is help our clients uh, really look at what is the business or mission objective that you're trying to solve and then applying that technology right to the right use case. So, so we're not trying to you know, say, well, hey, you, you really need this platform here. We're going to find a way to make it work. It's really looking at ways to enable technology to make the agency more efficient, more effective uh, with, with minimal time to, to, to value. So, so that's really our mission is, as, as uh, consultants and integrators is to make sure that we're meeting the mission needs in the most effective way possible. And as Cherian mentioned, we're using technology in almost every single 
uh, engagement that we have. And, and we, we find the benefits of low code that we'll talk about in a minute to really be a way to get the benefits of those use cases up and running into production in a very efficient and, and effective manner. So in that respect, um, it's exciting for us because uh, we want to solve client problems and what better way to do that with, with technology that can be leveraged um, in, in an efficient and effective way. So happy to join the conversation today. I think we're back to you, Bill. That's intros. Okay, appreciate it, Kirk. Uh, unfortunately, I lost uh, lost internet there for a second, but uh, I'm I'm back now. Um, so, um, Cherian, um, how does uh, you you mentioned you know the the tools that you're putting in place? How does the National Science Foundation select the right tool for the the right IT project? I'm assuming you start with the mission objectives, but at what point does a, a specific tool like Low Code enter into the conversation? A great question, actually. Um, so let me let me start by saying we have a defined process for adding any new technologies to our architecture, um, and and the process is well connected. And also, it, the process ensures the alignment of these new technologies with our agency strategy. Let's probably look at look at with an example here. Okay. Um, like I mentioned before, you know, we are going through a major transformation. Um, so what is happening is if you really look at the big picture here, uh, we have been uh, predominantly serving the research institutions across the nation. And the recent transformation is to scale up some of our investments uh, with our industry partners and also uh, scale up the programs that we are doing um, to increase the STEM workforce in the nation. So the, the, the business is kind of coming up with all these new ideas, how we would like to scale some of these uh, existing programs to meet this broader objectives. Now, when they're doing it, they are adopting something called fail fast, fail early model. So what it means in a nutshell is uh, it's very agile process. They come up with a list of ideas they want to test and they take uh, the first idea. Uh, first, they want to make sure it works and then they calculate the return on investment on this experiments. Uh, and then if the ROI is positive, they want to quickly scale up that idea and, and, and you know, uh, make it as an enterprise scale investment. If the idea fails, they want to quickly go to the next one and try the next idea, which uh, probably is going to work. So this is a very iterative and rapidly iterative uh, uh, process. Now, what happens is we we talked about uh, you know does it work or is that an ROI? How do you determine those steps? It's mostly the data is the evidence, and when you really add the digital power behind this data, and then you bring like uh, predictive and prescriptive capabilities, it really provides that super capability to the business, right? So, so the idea is to have a platform that supports this rapidly trading business models. And this is where the low code platforms come in very handy. Uh, and um, so we can trade uh, at the speed of the business as, as it tests new, new models. And, and we call this uh, as the speed and scale uh, uh, approach. So this is, this is how, like, hopefully I answered your question going back how are we connected when we are introducing this platform to our mission? This is how, this is one example. Uh, so the local platform really came in handy for, uh, uh, for expanding our mission uh, objectives. Wow, Thanks. that's very interesting. I appreciate it. I'm sure we'll, we'll learn more as we go on here. Um, Kirk, um, from your point of view, um, you know, uh, as a systems integrator, how does KPMG advise government clients regarding tools like low code? Um, for example, at what point in the process of evaluating a project does um, you know KPMG say, you know, hey, this I think this might be a good candidate for low code? Yeah, I, I would go back to my earlier uh, comment around looking at the particular business or mission objective and the use case involved. Um, you know, because what you don't want to do is, is over solve for the problem. And what I mean by that is, you know, you're trying to kill a fly with a sledgehammer. You, you may not need 
you know, a, a, an entire platform to address a certain automation, for example, maybe you need RPA and a use case is very much a, a swivel chair, you know, pulling data from one system and, and entering into another. That might be an RPA use case, which, oh, by the way, is a type of low code uh, technology. But when you get to the platform play, the low code platform plays that are out there, um, you know, it's looking at different systems across potentially uh, different organizations, enterprise approaches to data. Um, in some cases, wanting to maintain the data where it is and creating a kind of a, a user interface or, or a platform layer on top of it to make sure that you have a better user experience. So it really comes down to, as you start to dissect what the client's looking to do, it's applying the right technology solution to meet the needs of that particular objective. And, and I like the point that Cherry mentioned, a lot of that is driven by where, what data do you need visibility into? How do you need to flow that data through the various um, checkpoints in a process, whether it's you know a personal uh, workflow for a case or if it's certain approvals that need to happen for, through certain data sets, having an enterprise approach to that is typically gonna yield itself to a low code platform. We see a lot of organizations that are trying to get more extensibility out of legacy systems, for example, that don't want to completely rip and replace a legacy system, which would require, you know, both back, middle and front end uh, configuration. But why not put a low code platform on top of that to create a new experience for your users, but also integrate that data so that the user's perspective is that of a single system. However, you're, you're able to leave those legacy systems in place. So just an example of, of, of where we see low codes um, applicability. Do you see um, that wrap and renew uh, model that you just mentioned as being, you know, for government agencies to be a much lower risk than the rip and replace? I think it is because, you know, as you can imagine, just the term rip and replace sounds sounds more abrupt, right? Um, if I'm going to the doctor, I don't want to hear that term. But I mean, <laughs> when you're when you're looking at a, an implementation, you know, a lot of these 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 systems are in production currently, and they're very critical systems. What people don't realize is many of our financial institutions that are supporting your major um, transactions are all, in some, some cases, mainframe systems that they just can't shut down. And so the ability to keep systems where they are and, and almost you know, freeze wrap them and create a data store out of them to, to enable them to still serve a purpose around data uh, availability is one approach to minimize the risk that governments have to try to completely upend your architecture and replace it with a new ERP, for example, or a whole new custom custom build. So, so that's definitely something that we see as a lower risk approach for government agencies who again are trying to get more extensibility and, and, and frankly more, more useful life out of legacy systems. The, the other thing I'll mention too, and, and I think Sharon, you brought this up too, is, is, is reducing the time that you need to take for development to get to a value, to get to production. That is probably the, the biggest benefit to low code because we're all in agile right now. And, and you know, I think to, to stand up a low code app in a low code platform, I mean, you can do that in a matter of days. You know, we've seen that with some of our clients where there's a mission critical need that comes across the desk. We have to get a new app stood up in a matter of days. We're able to do that with these low code platforms versus trying to do a waterfall approach with legacy, um, you know, lines of code, if you will, versus the object oriented development that comes with low code. So in that respect, time to value is huge for any kind of low code use case. Great, I appreciate it. Sharon, you had mentioned, you know, obviously agile and failing fast as being one of the advantages. Um, what other advantages do you see of using a low code um, method or a low code platform versus traditional software development? Um, I'm going to build on top of what Kirk just mentioned. Um, so the rapid development approach, and that's where I'm going to be uh, starting. So it really facilitates the design center thinking. You know, if you really look at like the traditional way how we built applications uh, in the past, you know, we used to uh, document the user stories and then you do three or four sprints to come up with the wireframes. You put that in front of the users for feedback and then uh, you come back, build um, the interface and deliver, right? So it's kind of a, uh, it, it, that's kind of the format that we have been used to, but what this low code uh, solution brings is it crashes that whole thing down. So what happens is we go capture uh, the capabilities. Okay, tell, we, we sit with the customers, we understand, tell me what, what are the capabilities you want the system to do? And they provide a list. And in two weeks, we just go with the base configuration of this product and go, here is how it looks like, and then poke holes. And then they just come back and say, change this thing that, you know, do whatever that is, and then 
two weeks from there, you just go and say, here's the uh, configuration that's ready for your testing, and then you move on, right? So it's, it's really rapid thinking. So what, let, let me tell you the change management aspect here. So uh, the customers believed in the olden model that they had only one opportunity to make this work right. And right. now you're really looking at this and saying, okay, since this is fastly trading, if, we, if I made a mistake, I do have an opportunity to go back and fix it in two weeks. So I don't spend a lot of time and I'm just doing a lot of trial and error and then you trade on top of it to get to a configuration that best works for it. And also in the olden days, we used to uh, think, okay, we used to imagine a lot and assume things are going to work without actually putting that in practicality. And now with this new model, you're kind of overcoming those uh, uh, barriers. And then you're really uh, you know, having a system that is uh, centered around a design-centered approach, like where you quickly uh, build a configuration, put it in front of the customer, take feedback, it trade on it, and then the MVP goes out. So it is a huge uh, change, especially uh, we are talking about, I mean, let's take an example here, right? The pandemic hit us like two years ago. Look, people have been collecting a lot of this data. I'm just talking in general, not the government. Like, you know, the people wanted to collect all kind of pandemic data. Majority of them went with low code because they were quickly configurable and they put it out and then they started collecting the data. And that's what they did. And speed and scale aspect is huge in this. And that's where we are leveraging this low code platform. Gotcha. Kirk, um, do you think does implementing low code, does it require a fundamental mind shift when it comes to software development? How hard is it to convince, say, um, a, a system architect uh, in the government um, that low code is something that they should evaluate? Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Or is it not, not as big a deal as, as some think? Yeah, I mean, look, I think you're still going to have quite a bit of demand and need for, for the ability to, 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 to do custom code. I mean, I think, you know, obviously um, that is a demand that cannot be met in many cases through, through some of the object-oriented development that we see. But, but I will say it has created, um, you know, the ability for folks that want to get into development that may not want to do you know, the very detailed coding, the opportunity to, to get into technology, at least for us, we've been able to expand the ability to get more folks involved in technology that historically may have been, frankly, intimidated by uh, the idea of being a software developer, right? Um, so I think that in that respect, we've, we've been able to actually have a deeper bench of, of expertise for development of these low code uh, platforms and the various apps that we, we, we pull together for our, our teams. As far as, you know, someone that's, you know, very technical seeing low code as, as you know, not as much of a, a, you know, maybe a draw, I don't think we're seeing that. I think what we're, what we're seeing is a lot of folks in that kind of career path are recognizing that it is an evolution of software development is becoming more normal to, to develop in low code just because it's it's a lot quicker. It's again, it goes back to time to value and making our customers realize that they don't need to wait six months with a list of requirements and go through a waterfall approach. They can iterate and iterate and iterate. And the developers that I work with enjoy that. They want to iterate more. They want to bring you a product. They want to iterate on it again so that they're not waiting six months later. And then the customer is completely uh, misaligned to what you had built. So in that respect, it's it's becoming again more of an evolution of, of development versus you know a whole different skill set per se. Um, I guess I go back to and I am old enough to remember this, believe it or not. You know, the, the, we had punch cards before, right? And and you know we've we've evolved to, to discs, and then we get to hard drives that are physical hard drives. Now we have flash drives, and, and and so solid state. So to me, this is the same thing. It's an evolution of the coding regimen. It's an evolution of the way that we develop solutions. It's not necessarily any lesser or more of a discipline. It's just an, another tool in our, in our, in our toolbox that we can leverage to build apps. So I, that's, that's kind of a diatribe I know, but you know, I think that's at least what we're seeing. Gotcha. Yeah. So um, Kirk, you referenced it as, as giving uh, at least KPMG the ability to have a deeper bench. Um, Cherry and, you know, does low code help solve the challenge of 
developers because we know that you know there is challenge finding uh, you know qualified engineers uh, and you know we also know most organizations you know have long backlogs with change requests so um, you, you know does low code help solve some of those challenges? So I'm going to start by saying um, let's look at a typical model. Uh, you know we have the customers um, you know sitting on one side and the first thing we do is gather requirements and then translate into a design and code them right So we bring in uh, IT staff to sit with the customer to understand and the customer also brings in a lot of institutional knowledge uh, and that gets transformed into the business logics and the user designs and all this stuff. It is a fairly, uh, time-consuming process, and 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 also, like I said before, people believed it's a, it's a one-time thing that people would do, and then system goes live, and they they get to change it only during the maintenance cycles. Now, what this low-code thing, uh, and the reason why we do it is, one side we have all these great institutional knowledge and the business knowledge, the other side we have all these technology resources who are skilled in writing code and creating database and the systems are implementing systems, right? Now, what happens is that the low code kind of builds the bridge such that um, the people who are having institutional knowledge and the business knowledge doesn't have to learn some of these high uh, skilled uh, software to IT technologies to build applications. So what they, they do is, you know, this is going back to what Kirk was talking, even RPA is kind of a low code platform. What it does is, it's just like you're using a Visio to create a flowchart, you just create an automation, right? And the same thing this platforms does where you just take this platform and then uh, you just drag and drop and create a form, intake form, and then you want to build a workflow. You use some of these forms to build a workflow. You automate it. You do it yourself model, right? That's what it's facilitating. Now, what it, it created is an opportunity for citizen developers. You know, this is really the term that we use. And to facilitate this more, what we have done within the agency, again, one of our objectives is to digitally empower our staff, uh, which means you know, having them uh, augment with new skills. And, and so what we have done is we have created a community of practice. Uh, we have one for data, we have one for robotic process automation. Now we are also thinking about having, a, uh, having the RPA community of pra practice kind of broadened to call this low code or no code platforms. So the idea is to educate these people to tell them how, how easy it is to develop such applications using this platform. So we are doing this. So, so the idea is to generate more of the citizen developers and then translate the central IT to be more managing the platforms and providing IT orchestration support, those kind of things. So, so the, 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 the broader vision here is to really increase the pool of citizen developers. That is where the business knowledge uh, resides mostly, and then they sit closer to the problems, they sit closer to the user group. And when you give this kind of platforms to them, uh, it, it really is a nebula of innovation. Gotcha. Makes sense. Kirk, um, in terms of you know, building that bench uh, that, that you had talked about, um, you know, there's lots of different options. One is kind of reskilling traditional developers. Um, one is recruiting, you know, um, younger developers, potentially right out of college, teaching them low code, and they've, they've never had traditional um, software development, let's say .NET or Java, that sort of thing to, you know, um, uh, you know, in their background. Um, and then, you know, we've even seen things, um, you know, Cherry and mentioned citizen development. So I think you and I have both seen in the Air Force in, you know, innovation contests where citizen developers are introduced cold to a new technology and asked to play with it and, and see what they can build. Um, what are your thoughts on, you know, bringing um, new personnel into the, the low code environment? Yeah, I mean, it's you hit the nail on the head. I mean, we're in a very, um, I'll say, competitive environment for talent in, in this day and age, especially for tech talent. Um, and so one of the things that, that we've tried to do is build very robust enablement programs internally 
uh, to make sure that our folks are prepared to deliver quality solutions to our clients. Uh, we partner very closely with all the low code vendors out there to be sure that the software uh, training that they're providing, we have access to, we have alliances with many of those vendors. And so we work hand in hand to make sure that we're getting the latest and greatest solutions from a, from a training perspective to, to, to the broader um, population that's interested. And, and it's just like any of anyone else, um, we have a range of folks that are extremely technical. Um, and we have a range of folks that are, I would say, you know, less technical, not as much into coding, but have interest in developing these low code solutions. And so what we typically do is we, we bring folks in, whether they're college hires, experienced hires that have a technology background to a certain degree, and get them into these enablement programs. And then to make sure that we have quality delivery to our clients and, and basically lessons learned and accelerators day one, we kind of have this pod construct to where we're bringing a number of senior developers as well as some more junior developers and business analysts to have a team that can actually continue to develop and learn on the job as well as through the mentorship of our, of our senior uh, reach back um, in, in those particular technology areas. So it has allowed us to, again, expand that bench and provide quality delivery at the same time. I would say, could you bring someone in, you know, that doesn't have a tech background and get them into low code? Maybe, but I think what we typically see is you really have to still have a fundamental understanding of how to build solutions with, with technology um, so that you can kind of understand the rigor of an agile process, how to, how to you know, build out user stories, scrums, epics, those sorts of things, so that you can understand that there's still a process to it. Low code does not mean no process. It's, it just means that you're using different tools to get to the end state. Um, so bottom line, it gives us a lot of flexibility with resourcing, um, but I think you still have to have folks that have a general technology background. Um, and so that's what we look for, again, to your point with our college hires or experienced hires or folks that are already with KPMG that are interested in this. We put them through, again, our robust enabling programs and then implement those pod structures throughout. Gotcha. No, I appreciate it. Um, Charian, um, you had introduced the concept of citizen developers. Obviously, when you're working with citizen developers, you know, they're not used to, uh, have never been introduced to the rigor of software development, obviously DevSecOps and, uh, and so on, the, the concept of development, testing, deployment, um, you know, they, they want things as quickly as possible. Does uh, the National Science Foundation uh, have the concept of, and you might call it something different, but a center of excellence um, where, you know, uh, programs can come with ideas and there's resources there, more traditional software development folks, program managers that, that help a team of, of citizen developers get started and manage their project? Of course, yes. Um, like I said before, like, you know, we have developed a lot of community of practice, but before uh, I should have said something even bigger, like in 2018, there was a lot of appetite uh, in, in the agency to scale up local innovations. At that time, you know, the, R, the whole RPA was um, emerging, uh, you know, and some of these platforms also were emerging. Uh, so, but in spite of all those emerging and we need, we, I mean, the, the tools were a little behind than what we have today, but still there was a lot of appetite for uh, scaling up local innovations. So what we did was we set up a governance process to take some of these local innovations and how we would scale them up for a maturity path. So there's a group called Innovation Management Group. This is the group that is um, um, sponsored by our chief information officer. And uh, it is a group that is championed by both IT on one side and the business on the other side. And we have strong partnership with some of these uh, local innovation community you know, who are call, often called as entrepreneurs and creating some of these advanced solutions. So what this group did was they built um, uh, maturity matrix. Like, you know, they said, it's not even you have a solution or not. Even if you have an idea, you can get engaged in this process. So you have an idea. Uh, what we did was we created something called uh, R&D Labs. And there is a small group of people who support this infrastructure. And then we open up the labs for this uh, person to um, test their idea and prototype some of those uh, automations. And then the next step is, um, we call it as a nascent. So when they have something concrete released, we um, encourage them to put it in a place called uh, Hopper, which is a portal and it's called a self-service portal. So where 
Um, there's a, it's like a marketplace tool where people can subscribe, publish and subscribe. So the, the, the developer comes in, comes in and say, okay, I got an exper experimental product. Will you be willing to try it? At that point, we also make sure the security is aware uh, and then the policy and legal people are aware such product exists and there is a uh, collaboration channel, like a blog that goes along with the people to comment on it. Uh, and it builds a community around it, right? So then what happens is the portal also has um, uh, um, capabilities to track some of the usage and how people have been using it. And then it, it informs the governance, the innovation management governance, can it be moved to the next stage, which is called mature. What mature means at this point security is checking the box saying it's secure uh, and policy and legal are working to introduce them into their policy documentations and legal is saying, yeah, you're kind of good to go. And at that point, we also see more than one organization is using that product. And then what happens from there? Again, you, you monitor the usage and then based upon that, it goes to the next level called enterprise. And this is where, you know, it is really put it in our, uh, in our menu of applications. It's an enterprise uh, wide use tool. And it, it is like another enterprise system, like you know the, the financial system or HR, it's like treated the same way. Now we also have the last stage, which is optional. You can also integrate it with the, some of the main, mainstream applications that is optional. And then what happens is when you do it, central IT makes it part of their operational process. So you have the choice, you can just, stay at the enterprise uh, level, or you can also go to integrate. So this whole maturity matrix has um, really impacted in developing a lot of this, uh, uh, or energize the local uh, innovators, and we call them as citizen developers too. And guess what? And at, at some point, um, like a six or a year ago, we started getting a lot of recommendations from this group hey, have you thought about this tool, which is gonna help you advance some of these uh, local innovations? So we, we started getting uh, a lot of uh, you know, recommendations from this group. So now we are going back to the drawing board and how we should set up a process to take these recommendations and you know, the central IT has to vet through this properly to give approval. So we are, we are, we are taking this to the next level of maturity, but Right now, what we have is we have really harnessed a, a process to make the local developer empowered and they are really innovating at a scale um, that uh, inspires the whole organization in taking us to the next level. So the citizen developers is a blessing and uh, we have found a way to engage with them. And it, uh, our, uh, our story is like a Cinderella story, how it came uh, together working for us. That's great. Kirk, how do we overcome the challenge that, um, you know, low code is not right for our program. <laughs> uh, low code is not software development. Yeah, I think, you know, part of it is just, uh, frankly, an awareness of the benefits of, of low code. And, and I go back to my point around, you know, what is the end state you're trying to get to? Um, you know, if you're trying to get to, um, you know, automation of a case or, or workflow, you know, in, in a very fast time frame with, with minimal, um, you know, development cycles, um, you know, you can do that custom, you know, or, you know, throw a lot of developers at it, or, you know, perhaps, you know, low code is a better answer. And let's look at the compare and contrast. Again, we're not going to go in and try to force low code onto a use case. It doesn't make sense. Maybe there's a mission uh, use case or, or an agency use case that's very unique and maybe you just need to develop a few scripts and you're done. Um, you know, but nine times out of 10, if you're going to be developing, you know, something that's, um, you know, going to involve a number of different data sources and you, you really need to bring those together and you really want to have some type of workflow involved, then, then a low code solution is, is probably the best approach. So, you know, a lot of times we'll sit and have that discussion, maybe do an analysis of alternatives just to kind of put it out there and, and, and weigh the pros and cons. Uh, because again, I think it's, it gets back to what is the end state that you're trying to accomplish? I will say that we're seeing more and more uh, demand for, let's just say applications that are set up in a very short amount of time. You know, before you would see, hey, I need a, 
I need a system up in a year. Well, now we're seeing, hey, I want you to re reach milestone one in four months. Well, to reach a four month milestone, to go through all the cycles that, Ch uh, that Cherry and just talked about, where you know, you're, you're going through that DevSecOps um, you know, timeline, four months is very aggressive to do custom code. And so you know, low code is probably gonna be a better option when you have those really, really tight timeframes. And then again, you've got the, the extensibility, you can build in APIs to third parties, you can do so many different things with low code that would take a long time and a lot of custom code. So, you know, you look at things like stability, you look at things like, you know, the ability to upgrade to future releases. A lot of that is, you know, a benefit of low code and, you know, custom custom may not may not give you those benefits. Gotcha, I appreciate it. Well, Cherry, and I'll ask my last question uh, to you. Um, you know, given solar winds, co uh, colonial pipeline hacks, uh, putting a spotlight on critical vulnerabilities in cybersecurity, uh, across applications. Um, do you see low code platforms um, and the ability to deploy multiple applications uh, across one platform with, you know, security in place, um, uh, you know, an authority to operate applied to the platform? Does that help solve vulnerability challenges? So I'm gonna um, take this uh, from the operational aspects. Like, so when, what happens typically when such crises come, you would probably notice some people in the data center fat fingered a password or they, they kind of created a server with default passwords. And that's what it kind of comes to when you really look into these major hacks that's going on either in the commercial or in the government. So this is why federal government often say, uh, you know, they have kind of, uh, if you really look at the, the new cybersecurity EO, they are really talking or pushing the agencies to move to the cloud because the, the reason is the process is much efficient in the cloud. And the people who are really managing the cloud infrastructure really are trained to do so. Um, you know, so that is the maturity, uh, the level of audits, the level of uh, scrutiny that goes in the cloud, um, uh, space is much, much higher compared to a data center solution that you're hosting, right? So let's set aside that for a moment. Now you look at all these um, low-code solutions and they are mostly a platform as a service solution. They are like a cloud, uh, you know, you subscribe to um, either, it, it depends, you know, a lot of, lot of them have typical use cases, some are uh, proficient in service management, some are proficient in business-centric apps, some are proficient in, you know, desktop automations, you know, that the, they have different unique use cases, but majority of them, if you really look at them, these are uh, past platforms. So that's the advantage. So most of these are coming from the cloud and they are managed efficiently when it comes to cybersecurity and all these controls are put in place and they have to go through the FedRAM process. Um, so I, I believe strongly some of these challenges that we see today uh, that are often occurring in the data center world probably is gonna go away as things go into the cloud. And uh, the, the low code platform is an accelerator because it is a cloud solution most often. And uh, uh, it, it is accelerating such migrations with this another advantage that's bringing to the table, like you know the speed and scale aspect of it. So people are enthusiastic in migrating some of their legacy applications into this cloud space. So so I, I believe it's a it's a huge enabler. So I, 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 I'm seeing it all positive that we are in the right direction. So hopefully some of these uh, challenges would not exist in the new world. Gotcha. Well, Kirk, Cherian, um, I want to thank you both for your time and your insight uh, that you provided today. Uh, until next month, when we have another conversation with government trailblazers on the subject of low code in government, my name is Bill Bunch. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you.